Our scripture reading for this morning is the traditional passage of scripture uh, about Palm Sunday. It's found in the Gospel of Matthew, the 21st chapter, the first 11 verses. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the valley, village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt and uh, by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. They took, uh, this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to his daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt. They placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Now let us bow our heads for a prayer together. I give thanks to you, O Lord, that we can be a part of the crowd that welcomed you into the city, that we can be a part of the crowd that follows you, and praises you. But, O oh Lord, may we be the crowd that keeps on going with you. Come and speak to us and challenge us and uh, give us your peace, your grace, your mercy, and your Holy Spirit. For we wait for you with an expectancy, all in the name of Jesus, the one who cares about us all. Amen. When I was in high school, there was a great uh, emphasis made on memorization. I had to memorize a, a lot of different things, like the Gettysburg Address, the preamble to the Constitution, a uh, flower in the canted wall, and thank God I have not had to quote those things that I was required to memorize. But one of the things that I was also asked to memorize was that part of uh, Shakespeare's As You Like It, where uh, in a pensive moment, Shakespeare writes, all the world's a stage and the men and women are merely players. I remember my... My teacher at my junior year in high school, Mrs. Vincent, said, I don't just want you to memorize this. I want you to understand what William Shakespeare was saying, that life is like a drama, a play, and there are various acts of that play. Act one was when you were a, a little bitty baby and dependent upon your, ch your parents. And act two is you became, uh, you learned to, to read and write and to grow. And act three was when you moved on into independence. And she explained to us, I think maybe you just may be in act three, but what's going to happen in act four and five and six? She went on to ask. I think maybe I might even be close to the final act in life right now, as William Shakespeare described it. So I better say my prayers and be ready for the final act. That, uh, But there will be more, too. 
But who am I to argue with William Shakespeare that all the world's a stage? But I will say this. I think all the world may be a parade ground as well. There are all manners of parades that are going on in, around us, wherever we are, wherever we live, wherever we work, wherever we play. All different kinds of parades bidding us to come and walk that way and giving all kinds of false promises. And uh, what we do today is celebrate one of those parades, a significant parade. It's the parade that uh, we celebrate and remember on Palm Sunday, when Jesus triumphantly entered the gates, the golden gate into Jerusalem. Now, I want you to understand that that parade didn't start on, at Bethphage as it does in our scripture lesson. But it started much earlier than that, three years before, when Jesus simply said to a group of fishermen, leave your nets and follow me. And the scripture says that straightway they left their nets and followed Jesus. They were mere mortals, mere human beings, normal people. But they made a decision to fall in line with Jesus and to walk in his parade. And on throughout the ministry of Jesus, there were other people who fell into his parade, who followed him and who uh, came after him. And uh, great crowds fell in line to walk in this parade of Jesus. I've been to uh, Bethphage. I've been to the Mount of Olives. Walked down the same path that Jesus walked. Down through the Kidron Valley. The Golden Gate is, is sealed now. But I saw where Jesus had walked. That's not enough. I want to walk and follow him and be a part of that parade. And he has welcomed me into that parade as a, and I have joined many of my family members and many of my friends in walking in the parade with Jesus. Oh, there have been times when I've fallen out of line and walked over with another parade, but he was always there beckoning me back, bidding me to walk to the beat of a different drummer and get in line again, and he welcomed me back into a part of his parade. There's some things that I've noticed about the parade of Jesus, and one is that it's joyous. It's a joyous occasion. It was a joyous occasion on that first Palm Sunday. Uh, you can just see in the faces of the people the sense of celebration and joy. This, uh, this parade was way before we had to worry about distances to other people. You can see they're always together as they gather around Jesus and, and be a part of that parade. When I was a child, I loved Palm Sunday because it was such a joyous time. It was such a happy celebration and uh, seemed so different than church that I often went to that seemed to be so doleful. But Palm Sunday was filled with a sense of joy. My early ministry, I, I had an associate pastor that I inherited. And I, I went to the church for my very first Sunday. And uh, he led the worship service. He, is such a, he was very doleful. He wasn't that way except when he got up to lead the congregation in worship on Sunday morning. But I shall never forget that with a frown on his face, he said, this is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Our opening hymn is, oh, be joyful. And I the first thing I did on Monday morning when I got with him was I said, you know, yesterday when you were saying this is the day the Lord has made, let's be joyful. And I didn't believe you. And he said, what? Why not? I said, because you can't possibly say this is the day the Lord has made if you believe it and not have an excitement and a smile on your face. 
You're going to say, hey, hey, this is the day the Lord has made. We must rejoice and be glad in it. But you know, he never could do that. He couldn't get over that dolefulness. So I just had to have the, con- the choir to sing the call to worship. I feel like that one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is a sense of joy. And we see that in the parade on Palm Sunday, the parade of Jesus. There's a joy in your heart when you follow him. Then uh, I want you to notice as well, though, that Jesus is very focused in this parade. You can, uh, you can almost sense it as he's riding into the city. I, I used to think, what a, it's one of the few times where Jesus is so public, so open to the, to the people and acceptance of all of their praises. It seems to be so different than the humble Christ. But I think he was so focused, he wasn't even aware of the praises of the, con- of the congregation. I think he knew where he was going, and he was focused on going there. It was almost as if he wanted to throw aside the palm branches, throw aside the cloaks, throw aside the people, and make way so that I can go on to where I am destined to go, to the cross. I like the fact that he was focused. Someone has said, the windshield is always bigger than the rear view mirror. And I like that. So oftentimes, we look back more than we look forward. And we need to focus on what is coming, not what has been. And I'm excited about what's coming to New Hope United Methodist Church. I'm excited about what's going to happen in the kingdom of God. I'm excited about what's going to go hap- going to happen in your life, in my life, and what's going to happen in our homes and in our community. I like the focus that Jesus had of looking forward, of moving to where he would go, where he was destined to go. But then I want you to know that He's going to the cross for sure. And I believe that's where he wants us to go with him. When we drop into the parade, we're going to have to go to the cross as well. I've often said this, that you can be saved and never be a Christian. You're saved by the grace of God, but then you become a Christian when you follow Jesus. And Jesus didn't stop in Jerusalem. He didn't stop in uh, Gethsemane, the garden of prayer. He kept going. He kept going right on to the cross. And he bids us to go with him. I had a big brother who was my hero. He was uh, eight years older than I was. He was tall, handsome, had a great sense of humor. And uh, was a pretty good athlete. One day when I was about eight or nine years old, two bullies uh, got me and pushed me around and threw my bicycle into the creek. I was livid. And I was also frustrated because they were bigger than I was and I couldn't do anything about it. So I went home and I said to my big brother, Hero, I said, listen, these two guys pushed me around and threw my bike in the creek, and I can't whip them by myself, but I think the two of us can take them, so let's go get them. And he said, no, I'm not going to do that. And I said, what, are you chicken? He said, no, I'm not a chicken, I'm smart. And I said, smart, what are you talking about? He said, well, if I go with you and we beat them up, then they're going to go get their big brother to come and beat me up. Then we've got to go get somebody else to join us so we can go beat them up. Well, that's the way you start a war. So he said, I'm going to end it right now. 
I'm not going to go and beat them up. And I was, <laughs> I was so frustrated. And I said, well, what can I do about my bicycle? He said, get it out of the creek. <laughs> he was such a practical person. Went on to become a lawyer. And years later, I was serving a church. It was about 45 miles north of Nashville, Tennessee, which is where his office was. And this was during the period of uh, uh, the uh, uh, racial unrest and uh, the McCarthy era. And there was a man who was a member of the church that had gone around telling everybody that uh, because I had uh, uh, welcomed black people that I was a communist and that I was preaching communism. And uh, uh I put up with it for a long time. He never had heard me preach, but he was telling everybody what I was, what I was. He never met me, but he was blasting away at me. And I, I finally decided to confront him. So I was going by his house, uh, to deck him in the name of Jesus, of course. But when I got there, uh, he wasn't there. It's always amazing to me how God takes care of drunks and Methodist preachers because that man wasn't there. So I, but yet I wanted to do something about it. So I called my brother and said, I have a, I want to sue this man for defamation of character. And, uh, he said, uh, so I said, I'd like to talk to you about this lawsuit. So he said, well, come on down to my office. So I drove down and, his secretary took me into the office and into his office and he sat behind the desk and I sat in what was the client's chair. And he asked me about the problem and I said, look, I don't care about the money. I just want to sue this guy to shut him up. So, uh, take it and, and do what you can with it. <clears throat> and, uh, my brother was just like most lawyers. They have a very dry sense of humor and wit about him. And I, I, I remember how he sort of leaned back in his chair and he said, you know, uh, I don't know much about the Bible. I certainly don't know as much as you do. But nowhere in the Bible do I ever remember Jesus suing anybody. He said, of course, no one ever called him a communist. They just crucified him. Then he said, that's the man you follow, isn't it? And I said, yes, sir, it is. And then he said, well, follow him. Just follow him, Riley. Don't sue somebody. Just follow his example. And following his example means we've got to go to the cross. Not only go to the cross to receive forgiveness of our sins, to be washed clean and pure again, but it means where we go and die with him, where we put aside the things of the world, and we sacrifice those things that we have thought were so important and simply take up the cross and walk on after him. I believe Jesus is coming here right now on this Palm Sunday to where we are. He says to us, follow me. We do well to drop in line that incredible line that has wound its way through centuries of people who said, I will take up the cross and follow him. So should we. And that's the truth. Amen. Uh -huh.